So we're going to be talking tonight about a pretty philosophical topic, I think. Uh, it's philosophical, it's also quite practical. So we're going to have the first half is going to be very philosophical, the second half is going to be very practical. Um, I think if you've been to the meetup before, you probably know me, I'm one of the co-organizers. Um, I do a lot of work with domain driven design these days. I consult and train in it. Um, been doing a lot of conference speaking about it. I'm pretty excited about it. So much so that I've built this tool, Contextive. Um, we're going to be talking about that later this evening, give you a demo of that. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Share this tab instead. That's very helpful. Thanks, Seb. Um, hopefully, in the live stream, you can see now what I'm talking about. So, title page, me, and Contextive. Um, one thing I'm interested in, so I first prepared these slides to run a virtual meetup, and I do have people online now, but because there's people in person, haven't shared the link. But just sort of a bit of Q&A, I guess, but me asking you questions. Does anybody uh, document their ubiquitous language? Do you have a ubiquitous language? Do you document it anywhere? No? Got some wavy hands? Yeah? Yeah, yeah you do? Um, anyone on the live stream? Uh, I can't see any answers. If anyone on the live stream documents your ubiquitous language, feel free to unmute and tell us or uh, put a message in the chat. Um, so I'm curious about how. So is it like a wiki or a Word document or repo files markdown? Confluence, Confluence yeah. So in a wiki, yeah. You too? Redmine. Redmine. Ah, so Redmine wiki. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> I used to use Redmine. Love it. I didn't know anyone was still using it. That's pretty cool. Um, how do you help new starters learn your ubiquitous language? Just throw them at the code? Yeah, or it's a hint. Okay. So you have a recorded session of people talking about it yeah. and people watch the recording yeah. and hopefully learn something about the language. And, and is that recording specifically about the language or is it more about the domain? More about the domain. But through that, you learn the language. Very yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, how do you make sure it stays consistent as the business usage evolves? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to make sure the language of it stays consistent, but the implicit question behind this one is how do you make sure the system stays um, you know, consistent? Because when we say the language evolves, and this is one of the great quotes from Eric's book, a change in the language is a change in the model. And what we often find is that uh, the language evolves, but the models don't. And uh, even if your documentation gets updated, the, the models still don't. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely a challenge a lot of businesses are dealing with. Um, I had this one because the last time I did this was with virtual DDD, and uh, so there were people from all over the world. But this time I think everyone would be down here. So there's <laughs> no need to worry about that. So let's go to the slides now. I think actually I can do the presenter mode now. Cool. Hopefully everyone on the live stream can still see this. Yeah, cool. All right. So, this is going to be bringing a systems thinking lens to domain knowledge management. So we're going to start by just sense checking everyone's understanding and uh, I guess, you know, make sure we're all on the same page. What is a system? If you were to define a system, I uh, love Don Alameda's book and I love this definition of it. So I often refer back to this and say a system is an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. You notice this is deliberately incredibly generic. It applies to a lot of things. It applies to software, it applies to forests, it applies to our bodies, it applies to political parties, it applies to organizations, uh, it applies to very, very many things. Um, it doesn't, there's lots of things it doesn't apply to, um, but, uh, but, the, but you can use it as a way of thinking about a lot of different things that happen in the world. Uh, so I'd like to visualize it as we've got an internet connected set of elements. I put the word purpose down in a question mark uh, because purpose is subjective. So if you read Donella's book, she has some great examples of that. But um, one of the ones I really love is that a forest is a system. And if you are a squirrel, it serves one purpose. And if you are a logging company, it serves a different purpose. Um, really highlights that purpose is subjective. And when we talk about companies and the systems in the companies, uh, you know, it serves a purpose for your customers and then it delivers value. And it serves a purpose for you in that it maintains you having a job. So it's subjective and it depends on the observer of the system. Um, but we can go beyond that. We can, we can narrow our focus because that was very broad. And we can say, we're not talking about all kinds of systems. We're not talking about 
systems of like physics or planets or atoms or like biology. I'm talking about socio-technical systems. So a socio-technical system is one that considers requirements spanning hardware, software, personal and community aspects. So it applies to understanding the social structures onto the systems involve um, community and technology. So I often think about it as that, well, there's elements that are human or social and elements that are software or technical. Now, um, you can probably immediately start to think, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. Like we build software systems, but you know, there are humans involved in the changing of the systems, humans involved in the using of the systems. Um, so socio-technical kind of makes sense. Interestingly, the origin of the term was predates software completely. It came about in the 30s when um, um, a coal mine in the UK rolled out a new system of work for mining and productivity plummeted. And they said, we've put this new technology in, we've put this new system of work, productivity should have gone up. And on analysis, they realized that they had completely discounted a whole bunch of social factors, the hierarchy of the workers, the autonomy of the workers, the way that they had worked previously where they had freedom to make decisions throughout the day uh, and uh, make good decisions and choices and reactive decisions. Um, and they had rolled out a very prescriptive and hierarchical top-down work method, uh, which was not at all adaptive and completely destroyed their productivity. And they realized that you cannot just apply a technology solution without considering the social layer that sits around it, the humans that use it and the way they think about it. Um, so that was that was really interesting. And then over the years it evolved and there's been some, you know, a lot of literature and like academic works written about it. But I think only in the last couple of years have I seen industry engaging with this term. Um, probably a lot of people are familiar with Conway's Law. Um, that's something that is quite famous. It's kind of without saying it, a statement of socio-technical systems thinking. Um, it doesn't use that term. Uh, we can also think more precisely about open versus closed systems. So um, an open system is one that has uh, import or export flow. Lots of things flow back and forth across the boundary of an open system. Um, but we can visualize it in this way. So we've got a system with now a boundary to isolate it from its environment, but it's not completely isolated. It's interconnected. There's a flow and it might be, and the things in the environment are the humans, the non-humans, technology, climate regulations, laws, um, you know, all these sorts of things. And there's a flow across there. Sometimes that flow is physical material, like when, uh, you know, yesterday you didn't have a server and now you plug a server in and that server is part of your system. And sometimes it's data and information. And sometimes that data comes through channels like APIs. And sometimes it comes through market signals, like people have stopped buying our product or they've increased buying our product. That's data that flows into the socio-technical system. Um, because the API is only getting data into the technical system, micro signals are flowing into the socio-technical system. It's a way of drawing the distinction. So one thing that makes this makes it quite tricky, though, is understanding what's the boundary of an open socio-technical system. Uh, because, you know, if I was thinking about, like, what crosses the outer boundary of a socio-technical system? And it's a ton of stuff, like feature requests, like actual data, API calls, web responses and responses, web pages, market signals, audits, hacking attempts. They cross the boundary. They're not desired things to cross the boundary, but they attempt to. Um, vendor systems, they go from not being part of your system, you acquire them, they are now part of your system. And uh, you know it's really tricky. Right at the browser, you deploy code that runs in the browser. Is the browser part of your system? What's the boundary between your JavaScript and the, and the browser? Is it the JavaScript spec? What about if you're storing data in local DB? What's the boundary of your system? It becomes very hard, right? There's very fuzzy boundaries. Um, we can sometimes also think about what doesn't cross the boundary. Uh, so you might think like logs, commands and events internally, support requests from staff. I would say that's not crossing the boundary because the staff are part of the system. They're part of the socio-technical system. And feature requests from staff are not crossing the system. Customers is an interesting one. If a human becomes a customer, were they, once, were they not part of the system and now they are part of the system? Or are they not part of the system and just their requests for activity are part of uh, flowing into the boundary of the system. So one way that people sometimes think about this is like, you know, what's our what's our locus of control? What can we control or design? What can we not control or design? There's a temptation to think in these binary ways and say, well, we design the system, so anything we don't design is not the system. And uh, we didn't design how the customers behave, so they're not part of the system. But actually we kind of do, we give them a process that they have to follow if they want to get the thing. So they are kind of like we're kind of designing their actions, but they don't always follow it. So I like to think of it as a continuum. And that helps you realize that actually, you know, customers sometimes act as we intend. Our code usually acts as we intend. It doesn't always though, does it? 
like quite often our code doesn't at all act as we intended. So if you think about this continuum of how often do things act as, they, as we intend, I think it's pretty clear that almost nothing is at the spectrum of always acts as we intend. Um, and you know, maybe you can probably think of things that never act as we intend, uh, but that's pretty clearly not part of the system. But anything on the continuum, you could make a case in different scenarios that it is part of the system or not. So you know, I don't say this to overly confuse people, but just to highlight that you should be open to the possibility of thinking about things as being part of your system that you previously thought were not. So now we're going to apply all of that open socio-technical systems theory uh, to domain knowledge and to the, the acquisition and maintenance thereof. So often people have this kind of linear flow, particularly if you've not engaged with the domain-driven design literature. Uh, you have this sort of like waterfall-y kind of model. There's domain experts. They acquire domain knowledge through working uh, in the domain, uh, and then they pass it on to developers. But actually, you know, these days we tend to acquire that domain knowledge through collaborative modeling. We talked about it. Someone brought up event storming before, domain storytelling. Uh, it's quite popular. Event modeling is another one that's getting some traction. Um, so, you know, there's this sort of like notion that the domain experts have the knowledge and they acquire it from working in the domain. And then we acquire the knowledge through collaborative modeling um, with the domain experts. Um, you know, which is sort of true, but it's, you know, not that straightforward because domain experts acquire and produce the knowledge, but they don't just acquire it, they also produce it. So, it, you know, sometimes people think, oh, we, we go and discover the domain, like there's a mountain out there and we just have to go and find it. Or maybe it's like, a, you know, it's underwater, we can't see it, but if we just sort of reach around enough, we'll feel the shape of it and then we'll, we'll know what it's, what's there. But it's, it's not like that. It's an open socio-technical system. It's, it's amorphous, it's subjective. Everybody has a different perspective on what it is. Um, I like to use that distinction between, like, people often get confused about the difference between subdomains and bounded contexts. And one way of thinking about it is that subdomains are subjective. They're personal definitions or personal ways of understanding the domain. And everyone's probably going to have a slightly different vision of what they are. But a bounded context is intentional. It's a design decision. So you can choose what bounded context you're going to have. You can't tell someone how they think about the subdomains. That's their choice. Um, but you know, through all these interactions you can see on this diagram, there's a ton of things that impact domain knowledge. So vendors produce domain knowledge through providing components that constrain the solution. So the solution itself becomes part of the domain. We acquire domain knowledge through a collaborative modeling, but also we produce domain knowledge through designing solutions that become part of the domain. Um, I did a demo of Contextive uh, at a meetup in London, and uh, I asked the hosts to help me model the domain, um, and they were a recruiting company. And I said, all right, let's model recruitment. And I said, so give me a term from the domain of recruitment. And he said, OK, Boolean. <laughs> it's like, OK, how is that part of your domain? He said, well, you know, when we're looking for a candidate, we run a Boolean search. We go, OK, we want a candidate that's got five plus years experience in Java and C Sharp or AWS experience and senior. And they've, got, they've worked in these environments. So it's like all these criteria, and, and, and. That's a Boolean search. And so I, I apologize to him on behalf of our profession <laughs> for having been uh, you know, subject to this sort of technocratic takeover of the language um, where the developers said, well, that looks like a Boolean search to me. So now all of the recruitment industry has to refer to it as a Boolean search. Um, and that's what happened. Uh, so, but, but, it, but it does happen, whether we deliver intended or not. The solutions we deliver constrain the domain. They affect the way people think about the domain. They often come to us with requirements that are expressed in terms of the existing solutions changes to that solution. Um, and, and you've sort of wrestled with this because you've gone through a domain modeling process and you realize actually there's a whole bunch of words that better describe what we're doing and trying to get the business to update their language because they're tied into the terminology that was selected previously. That's what they've gotten used to. That's become the domain for them. And you see this as well when you get requirements like, I want a button that's going to create a record in the database. It's like, why do you even care about the database? What are you really trying to accomplish? Um, so, you know, but, but that, that feedback loop is there. And so I think domain driven design, one of the things I love about it is that it opens our eyes to it, helps us like mitigate it and try and uh, manage the consequences of it. But also there's other workflows, regulators, lawmakers uh, also set context and constraints. And all of this comes together. There's probably many other sources of domain knowledge that I'm not thinking about or illustrating this, but it's not so linear as before. Now there's also this complex relationship between domain knowledge and the people involved. So. Um, you know, you have domain knowledge as understood by customers, experts, and developers. That should say expert, not export. Actually, I think the nice thing about Miro is that I can fix this on the fly. There we go. How is that? 
Um, so domain experts understand domain knowledge, developers understand domain knowledge, customers understand domain knowledge, and we encode the domain knowledge into our code. Um, but this diagram is deliberately drawn with everyone's got their own brains and their own little books. So they've all got their own versions of how they understand the domain knowledge. The only thing that's a fact is the code, but then also you've got different people's interpretation of that code. So one thing I really like about that definition of an open system as opposed to a closed system is these bolded parts. It's interaction between components and the environment resulting in the modification or evolution of the system components. So if you just think about the technical system, we are the environment and our interaction with the technical system results in the modification of the system components. We change the code. But another way to think about it, if you think about the socio-technical system, is that the interactions with the environment, the feature requests, the domain knowledge changes, the regulatory changes, whatever they are, they result in the modification of the system components and we are part of the system. So we are the system changing itself, which is kind of a nod to Carl Sagan, who once said, we are the universe understanding itself, one of my favorite quotes, um, but you know, in a much smaller, less grandiose scale, we are the system changing itself in our organizations. We are components of the open SSH technical system. The knowledge in our heads is a component of us. Think about components or substructures, sub-elements of a, of a system. So there's a lot of components of us, our bodies, our hearts, our brains, but knowledge is kind of an abstract component that is, is part of us. And so that knowledge uh, is a component that gets updated through interactions with the environment. The, we have change requests come through, we interpret the change requests, we interpret the change request through our current understanding and through that process we try to evolve our understanding and our mental model so we are changing ourselves in order to uh, fulfill the request and through that process we try and change the other parts of the system as well so this really is, is drive home by this great quote from Andrag Magnorsky who is the creator of a great uh, session format called bite-sized architecture sessions if you haven't come across this I recommend checking it out really helpful way to um, uh, you know, help your team understand the architecture. And it's very, I think, aligned with practices like domain-driven design, but it's more oriented on understanding technical architecture than it is about understanding the domain. But she makes this point that you ship what's in your developers' heads. How they have come to understand things is what's going to go live, not what the domain experts necessarily thought or intended. And I see some nodding heads there going, <laughs> yeah, we've seen that happen. Um, but, the, but a couple of, um, well, last year I saw a great talk from a guy called um, Tudor Gerber who said almost the opposite of this. You ship what's in your code, not what's in your developer's heads. And I'm like, hang on, that's right too, isn't it? What's going on here? Because it's true, like if you've misunderstood the code, it's not your understanding that goes live. It's what's in the code. That's why we have bugs, right? Because you're looking at the code and you're thinking, well, I get it and there's no bug there. But then it turns out there is a bug because you've misunderstood it. And so I thought about this and I thought about it through a systems lens. And I realized that we've got developers with all these feedback loops. We're learning from the domain experts. We're checking our understanding with the domain experts through collaborative modeling. And Andrea's comment is that you ship what's in the developer's heads, not what the domain experts intended, is an exhortation to do this better, to learn from the domain experts better, to collaborate with them better. But Tudor's comment is, you know, we write our code and then we read the code to understand how it works. And he's saying, do that better. <laughs> do a better job of understanding the code. And they're both right in different ways. I think at the end of the day, Tudor is probably slightly more right because it's it's neither the domain experts knowledge or the developers understanding that goes live. It's the code that actually goes live. Um, but I think Andrew's comment is still very important in that it highlights this gap between expectation and intention to implement. Um, and then there's this other sort of outer feedback loop that we see there where the code as implemented affects behavior and understanding. Um, and so, you know, people react to what they see in the, in the SIP working system and then that refines how they understand the domain and the way in which they ask for changes as well. So, you know, sort of the process here is we interpret change requests through our current understanding. We try and evolve our mental models and understanding and then we try and update the code to reflect that new understanding. Now, that's all well and good in an abstract sense, talking about an arbitrary sort of notional developer, but really importantly, like, we're not fungible. Humans are not fungible tokens. We are unique individuals. And so a real system diagram has to include every single individual person and the knowledge in their heads because we've all got our own perspectives. And I think there's a really interesting uh, parallel here we can draw because we probably, we're probably like we all familiar with the concept of coupling, right? So two classes are coupled. Uh, if there's some sort of dependency between them, if in working in one class, you have to understand the other class, or if you make a change to one and that change propagates, you have to change the other. This is the kind of the notion of coupling. Um, but you can think about domain knowledge as being coupled as well, because 
what I just described is a process where there's a change in one person's understanding and we have to update other people's understanding as well. Isn't that the definition of coupling? So if we're thinking about our, our knowledge in our heads as system components, then we've got change coupling between the product owner and the developer. Um, we, the developer has already existing knowledge of the class. The class is change coupled to the other class. So somehow there's some change coupling between those two developers as well. Because if the two developers are not working together and they've both got knowledge of different parts of the system, and the system has change coupling, then the two developers need to update each other's understanding as well. So there's this kind of like flow of knowledge through the individuals. And I think that you can reasonably and usefully think about that as a form of coupling in the same way we think about um, coupling in code. Which highlights then that if someone leaves, that knowledge is lost. The system is broken. It's like turning off a server or deleting a database because all that data and information and understanding is gone. And particularly if they're the ones with the knowledge of the coupling in the system, uh, that, that creates a whole bunch of problems. Because uh, you know, developer Chris might be able to absorb the change coupling from product owner Priya and use the knowledge to update class entity. But if the person who understood class coupled entity is not around, they're not going to know that they have to update coupled entity as well. And so that change coupling will be hidden until it becomes very expensive and difficult to um, execute on. So I think this is kind of related to the notion of technical debt. In fact, I think that lost knowledge should be considered technical debt. We often just think about technical debt as shortcuts that we took in the code base um, or sort of like hacks, workarounds and whatnot. But, but I think if you go back to the way Ward Cunningham first defined it, and he didn't define it in 2009, but he clarified his intention in 2009 in this video. He said, I'm never in favor of writing code poorly, but I am in favor of writing code to reflect your current understanding of a problem, even if that understanding is partial. He never intended technical debt to mean, oh, we're just going to skip the test this sprint. We'll catch up later. That was not what he meant. He didn't mean technical debt to mean, well, we can see that this is the right way to do it, but actually the customer needs it live yesterday, so we're just going to code up some hacky solution. What, what he meant it to be is, we can't sit here analyzing this problem forever. We have to start with our current understanding, and we will learn through the process of building. And then by the end, we will know more, and the gap between how we would have built it if we had known then what we know now and how it actually is, that's technical debt. That gap between what we would have done if we had known and what we actually did. And that's unavoidable. You can't avoid that kind of technical debt because you always learn through building. Now, there's another interesting quote about coupling. Kent Beck said this last year at DDD Europe. He described the cost of a system as being approximately equal to the cost of changing the system. Um, because the initial build is virtually insignificant compared to the, the um, total cost. So the cost of changing the system is approximately equal to the cost of the big changes. There's a ton of the changes you can make are super simple. And then one change comes along, and all of a sudden you have to update everything. And that's super expensive, and that dominates the cost profile. Um, and that's what we're saying. Changes that spread are the expensive big changes. And that's coupling. Changes that spread are coupling. Uh, he also clarified that. Uh, Two components are only, you should only really consider them coupled with respect to a particular change request. So if you get a change request and you can fulfill that change request in just one component, well, you wouldn't feel like it was coupled, right? You would say, hey, this feels like a really nice solution. I could change it in just one module. Everything's fine. And then a new change request comes along. And it's like, oh, this blows up our whole model, our whole architecture. Now we have to change it in really in 10 places. It feels like a really tight coupled system. So is the system coupled or is it not? It's not a property of the system. It's a relational property of the system with respect to change. And uh, I sort of take that further and say, it's a relational property of the respects of the system with respect to a given change as being executed by a given team. Because you have a team that knows, and they know about the impact of the change, and they can plan and execute the change quickly and easily across even the 10 different places. It will be nowhere near as expensive as a team that makes the change, blows something up, gets a bug reported out of QA, has a two-week cycle to go back and fix it, and another two-week cycle to get it tested. Um, and that's way more expensive. And that's the kind of coupling that people hate, the kind of coupling that feels like tech debt, the kind of coupling that makes people think of big balls of mud. And I think the case I'm making here is that, yes, there are definitely systemic structures that you can put in place to reduce that. Bounded context from DDD really helped. Well-designed bounded context, loosely coupled bounded context. Um, you know, modularity within a bounded context, well-designed aggregate boundaries. They all help reduce the probability of this kind of coupling. And if they're well aligned to the domain, they increase the probability that most change requests will be satisfiable within a given boundary. They never guarantee that all change requests will be satisfiable within a given boundary. I don't think I've ever seen a system that could promise that. Um, but if you make a good bet, if you have good domain knowledge, if you've come up with good boundaries, 
then you can stabilize on a design that 90 to 90 percent five percent of your changes are easily handled by a single team or within a single boundary but as soon as the knowledge of the coupling that's present because no system is so well designed um, then it feels far more coupled than it might have felt if that person was still around. So I think that's reasonable to say the cost of big changes is proportional to the accuracy, completeness and relevancy of the knowledge in the right people's heads. So I think this is important and I think it's under undervalued. And what this leads me towards is a philosophy of phenomenological software, which is a bit of a mouthful, but phenomenology is the sort of philosophical term related to the idea that things are experiential. There is no, uh, What's the word? There's no like um, concrete objective reality. There's just subjective experience. Now, I don't necessarily believe this about the universe. I think there is an objective reality about the universe. Um, but I think that we all have a different experience of working with the code. And that experience uh, is in large part what we mean when we say things are tightly coupled or things are hard to work with or you know things have a bad design. Because the creator who knows the design can probably affect changes very easily and feels like it's very quick and easy to work with. So what the industry has been working on is to try and come up with standard patterns and to educate people about those patterns, to use those standard patterns so that when you engage with the code base, it's familiar and comfortable and it feels like something that you already know. But when you think about it through this lens, you can realize that that's the familiarity that is important, not the patterns themselves. That's not to say that the patterns aren't important at all because there are definitely some patterns that objectively and provably uh, are better than others. But um, you know, if you're not familiar with the patterns, it's going to be just as hard, uh, you know, as if it was just a terribly poorly designed system, even if someone has put a lot of thought into design, designing the system, but they're using patterns you're not familiar with. Who's working in a system that uses event sourcing? Anybody? Are you familiar with it? So event sourcing is a pattern for you know, how you persist state uh, as a series of events. If you're not familiar with event sourcing, trying to work in a system that uses event sourcing is going to feel really hard. It's going to feel really uncomfortable. And but if you're right familiar with this event sourcing, it's going to feel really easy and well designed. So, can we really say a system is well designed or not? Or can we only say it's well designed for a given team with a given body of knowledge using a given set of tools with respect to a given set of changes that are currently being requested of them? Because even the most well designed system can have a change request come along that blows up all of the preconceptions around what, what it was ever going to be expected to do uh, and will make the team feel like it's a badly designed system because it's hard to do the change they're trying to make. So if we think about the ways that we often try and um, address this, particularly with respect to domain knowledge, we put it in a wiki. So Confluence, um, it's a really common place to try and capture that domain knowledge. And it's, I'm gonna say it's better than not doing anything. Uh, at least there's some effort being applied. But of course, as we all know, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get another change. Change coupling is gonna flow through the people's heads and into the code, uh, but it's not gonna get to the wiki. Yep. When I do this and I ask people like, okay, so you've got a wiki, what's the probability that like 50% or more of the pages are out of date or stale? And there's this kind of like shame faced looking away because of course it is, it's, but it's like natural, it's normal, it's hard because it's like, it's over here. It's not over there, it's not where you're working. Um, and because once you have the knowledge in their heads, you're not consulting the wiki every day. You're not going back to it and just checking your definition because as you've built up the main knowledge, it's in your brain, you know about it. You engage with requests through how you understand the world. You might only engage with that wiki when you first join the company and then probably never again. And yeah, question? Yeah, how do you do it in reverse? How do you you've got the code that has knowledge? Mm -hmm. so how do you get that into the wiki? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm trying to, um, the, the other point I was gonna make though is that like when there's a change that comes in and a developer needs to work on a code base they're most familiar with, unless you've built the discipline and the habit, you're probably gonna just try and execute the change without going and consulting the wiki, right? So, you know, they, they, they're better than nothing, but when it, when it comes to the practicalities of doing the job, they often, uh, you know, end up not adding that much value. Yeah, of course. Context of this, how do you feel that people tell you that that's just semantics? That's, you get in That's just semantics. You mean in terms of like debating definitions? In, in terms of, yeah, not wanting to talk so much about the definitions because just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. try to dismiss the problems. And, like, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I've been pretty fortunate. I haven't hit, I, I know the problem you're talking about. I have hit it occasionally, um, but I, you know, usually try and shut it down pretty quickly by like, you mean, you, that is the problem, right? Like, yeah. Dismissing the semantics and therefore shit gets outdated and people don't update because mm. they feel like I understand facts. So I yeah. Need to, like, worry about the semantics. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like if you don't have the right definition, if you don't have a definition, you don't. Know, yeah. And I think, yeah, and I think it's very revealing when people say that's just semantics because you mean what you're saying is that's just like the, the whole basis of understanding and communication. <laughs> You mean, oh, that's just the thing that's really important for us to be sure we're talking about the same thing. Um, yeah, so I mean, I try and do point that out to people when they say, oh, we're just debating semantics. And it's like, okay, well, bear with me, because uh, I feel like I don't understand it well enough yet, and I'd really appreciate some more time so I can understand it. So I don't engage with the comment about semantics. Like, that snarky response is just in my head. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it's usually it's usually more, yeah, no, fair enough, I, I see your point, but, um, but still, I'm going to struggle to build this uh, at the moment. I'd really appreciate a bit more time to just talk it through. And try and get some consensus. So, you know, it's just it's more of a relationality, like a relationship management process. I think. <laughs> You're never going to convince them to care about semantics, but if you can convince them that there's value in it for them to continue engaging in the conversation, like they're going to, you're going to get a better result if I understand this better. So let's keep talking about it. You know, that can sometimes help. I'm not going to guarantee that that's a surefire solution. It depends on the person. Um, as I've been talking about, individuals are non fungible so yeah. But yeah, obviously, the new developers, they're not consulting the wiki. So you do some effort. And what I've seen with these things, and what I've happened when I tried to do it, is there's this big flurry of effort. We get everything documented in the wiki, and then nobody looks at it for six months. And then someone joins, and someone says, oh, go read the wiki. It'll teach you everything. And they go and read the wiki, and then they start using the code. And they're like, this, uh, this doesn't make any sense. And then they go ask someone, and they go, oh, yeah, no, that's changed last month. We, uh, we just haven't got around to update the wiki. You're like, you're like, people are going like this. And I'm like, yeah, it's a lived experience, right? You've, you've all been there. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes that's a good practice. You say, you know, as part of your onboarding, you make it explicit. And you say, look, we know that things are out of date. If you find an uh, improved way to provision your machine, like submit a PR with a script improvement, if you find some documentation that's up to, out of date, update it. Um, and I think that's a really effective way of keeping the documentation up to date. Um, or I should ac more accurately say, it's a more effective way than doing nothing at all. But is it really effective? I don't know. It still like has its challenges. It depends a lot on how frequently you're onboarding people and how many people you're onboarding. And uh, ironically, the more frequently you onboard and the more people you're onboarding, the less this can work because everyone goes, oh, someone else will deal with it because there's 15 people onboarding at the same time. But if you've only got one person and they're coming along every six months, they're probably a bit more motivated because there's a bigger debt to clean up and they're the only person there. So there can be some really weird systems effects in how this actually plays out. Um, so that's kind of actually the end of the slides. Uh, that's the theory part, that's the philosophy part. Uh, I appreciate you indulging me because I really like talking and thinking about this stuff. Um, but actually what we're here to do today is to give you a practical demo of a tool I've been working on to, I'm not going to say solve this problem, but incrementally improve the situation for people. So I'm going to stop sharing my browser and start sharing something else. So what I've been working on is, a, is an IDE extension. So my hypothesis was, uh, if the knowledge is in the wiki and that's too far away, let's bring the knowledge closer to the people and where they're working. Uh, let's try and make it visible and present in the places that you need it. Uh, and in a way that makes it easier to keep it up to date when you identify that it's not uh, no longer up to date. That's kind of the, so that whole preamble was a long winded way of getting to that point of saying, let's just bring the knowledge to where people need it. So the way this thing works is you create a um, folder called Contextive. The name of the tool is Contextive, uh, inspired by the context, the, con the word bounded context from domain from design. And you create a YAML file. And so in this file, you have to just create a list of contexts, but we'll start simple. Um, and so you can put a definition of a term in here. So what, um, anyone want to volunteer to model their domain? You know, a big crowd from PEXA here. Tell us a little about the domain of PEXA. What's a term in the domain of PEXA that is sort of like special in that domain? Settlement? Yeah, nice one. So as soon as we add this file to the definitions file, um, if I have, if everything, oh, it's the demo gods, of course. Maybe this, this is going to work. There we go. So the, it now knows that that term is special, and when you hover over it, you get this little tooltip with a icon of a book and the word settlement. But it says undefined. It's being a bit sort of cheeky and saying, give me a definition. So how would you define this term? When you're getting more 
from so money moving from your by itself. Yeah. <laughs> buyer to seller. Buyer to money moving from buyer to seller. Okay, so now when we hover over it, we get that definition in the hover. Um, now, the thing that is kind of interesting about this and the deliberate design decision is that it's just looking for that text in any file. So if you've got uh, a, um, yeah, you'll see that as soon as I start, um, oh, autocomplete in the code also comes up with that definition. Um, and if you hover, you get the definition as well. But because also it's just looking for it, if we have a property, um, uh, I can type. You get that there as well. It can find the word as part of sort of more compound uh, terms. Because it's just looking for the word, it can. Um, uh, you also get it here, and it supports plurals too, so I can find the, the plurals of the word. And because it's just looking for text, um, works in markdown files as well. So it's really trying to, you know, the concept of the ubiquitous language, it's trying to make it genuinely ubiquitous, like everywhere that you would use that term, you get support for using the term definition uh, support with the hover uh, thing there. So that's the that's the simplest thing you can do, just a name uh, and a definition. The other thing you can do is um, define example sentences, because as we all know from the manager of design, it's about the language, it's about the usage of the word in language. So what's a sentence that someone would say using the word settlement, something that a buyer or a seller would say? Basically, they will talk about the property needs to be settled on this particular time. Okay. Um, so I'm going to say the settlement should occur at this date on yeah. this time. So that's making me want to define the word slot um, because presumably that's got some special domain meaning. But now that we've given it a usage example, the, the, the tooltip gives us that as well with a little speech bubble. And I made it a list so you can give multiple usage examples because um, I think nothing helps understand a term rather than seeing its usage. Um, the definition is kind of fine uh, and it gives you an idea, but the, you can see there's a lot more um, value in the, um, in the usage examples. And you can come up with more as well. And you can list as many examples as you want. The other thing that people have asked for uh, is, you know, sometimes you have aliases. So terms that uh, slightly different words, but actually are referring to the same thing. Sometimes that's just a consequence of um, you know, historical baggage, but in the code, you used to use this word, and we've now decided to stop using that word and use a different word, but we haven't updated all the places in the code. So you wanna have the alias and get the same definition. So do you have that situation? There's like an alias for the word settlement, like payment, or, or is that in a different context? Yeah, so like the service will name the settlement actually does two things. So it's mm -hmm. like payment service when it does settlement and dispersion, right? Ah. Within the payments situation, yeah. Ah, interesting. So disambiguation. So that's a that's actually one where if you were to adopt, uh, I'll I'll stop the aliases for a second because um this is going to seem down a different path. But if you were to say we've got a um. Uh, property settlement context. Um, you know, it says to uh, manage the transfer of ownership of the property. Is that right? Um, so that definition is incorrect for this context. Um, so we'll put uh, um, the kind of a bit redundant, but you see what I mean? Uh, and then we have another one, which is like payments. That's where transfer of money is applicable. So you've actually got the same term in two contexts, two bounded contexts. Um, 
just an interesting side effect of that. I uh, not a side effect, but an aside. Uh, for a long time, I used to think that um, the the definition of the ubiquitous language in the DDD world was a bit uh, weird because you say, oh, there's this omnipresent language that's everywhere, but also it's different in every context. It's like, well, is it really ubiquitous if it's different in every context? Um, and then I was rereading the blue book at one point and I realized he actually already addressed that and we've kind of forgotten about it because uh, Eric introduced this idea of dialects. So the idea is that it is a ubiquitous language. It is the same dictionary everywhere, but uh, the contexts have their own dialects of the language. And so that resolved it for me. And so really what we've got here, we've got two contexts two dialects of the ubiquitous language, and in the uh, property settlement dialects, settlement means one thing, and in the payments dialect, uh, settlement means something else. And, and that makes a lot more sense when you think about it that way, when he also said the terms, the names of the context are part of the language. Um, because if you think that the, con the language is only defined within the context, like, has the name of the context part of the language of the context? But think about actually ubiquitous language is a global thing. It's a global dictionary, um, but the global dictionary includes uh, dialects, um, but the names of the context are part of it, so you should be able to use sentences like, in the context of property settlement, the word settlement means X, and in the context of payments, the word settlement means Y, and that's a, con that's a, that's a sentence that is fully comprised of valid, meaningful words in the ubiquitous, official ubiquitous language. So we want to try and capture all of that into this definition, so that's the goal of this project, is to give you a, a structured way to capture your ubiquitous language with definitions and with um, examples. So now that I've done these two contexts, um, Oh, I have messed up the YAML somehow. Is it uh, probably this one? Remember that? There we go. So now you get both of them. So it's a very greedy match because in a given file, like right now, it doesn't know whether we're in the property settlement context or the payments context. But, and this is why it's called contextive is that if you would like to know that, you can um, you can tell it where the contexts are located in your folder structure. So we can say property, move the settlement file into the property folder, and then we can go into the property thing and introduce a past property. So it's uh, work. Now if we go into settlement, we should just, Oh, yeah. It's matching the property one, but it's also matching the payments one because the payments one is not restricted. So I need to also put a restriction on the payments one um, because payments is saying I'm everywhere at the moment. Um, but if we say payments is only in payments, then if we go into settlement, we will just get the property settlement definition. So that's pretty cool, right? Context aware definitions. So uh, if we create a payments context, Settlements, uh, you know, maybe we're working in Kotlin. Um, we still get settlement, but here we get the payments context, and here we get the settlement context. So that's kind of a really key feature of this. Now, obviously, because it's used path mapping, it's kind of intentionally supporting deliberately like the mono repo structure um, with the assumption that you've got your context in separate paths within the mono repo. A lot of teams are using a repository per bounded context, which I think is a very good pattern. Uh, and that's quite simple because you just create a separate definitions file in each repository, so each context lives in its own repository. Um, a lot of teams are also doing something that I don't necessarily think is a good idea, which is like a repository per nano service, <laughs> even though every service is actually part of the same bounded context and sharing the same domain models and accessing the same database. So think about like uh, serverless functions where every serverless function gets its own repo. Um, but they're actually like just different implement, like one's implementing the post handler for a particular route and the other one's implementing the, you know, it gets really ridiculous. Maybe not quite that fine grained, but um, I've certainly seen teams that spin up that have got like 10 repositories per bounded context uh, because, you know, they've got uh, some APIs, they've got some queue workers, maybe a Kafka thingy, and, and they're all really part of the bank and same bounded context. They're all dealing with the same domain models, the same concepts, they need the same definitions. Um, and this model as it currently stands does not support that so well. And I was very fortunate last year at Command Driven Design Europe, I got to meet Eric Evans and I had 10 minutes with him to demo this tool and he was, you know, seemed quite interested in it. Um, and I talked to him about this challenge and he has he's a very dry whiff. He said, well, if they're doing that, maybe they don't deserve your tool. 
<laughs> but he was very clear that in his view, uh, a bounded context is uh, should be in one repository and not spread over multiples. But unfortunately, the microservices craze has kind of led to a lot of less than clear thinking in that regard. Uh, and that's what we've got. So, so we've got, uh, so I asked about aliases before and we got back actually uh, what in uh, DDD terms is called a false cognate. So the word settlement as defined in the two contexts is a false cognate. It's not the same definition. And so by splitting it into separate dialects and separate bounded contexts, uh, we can get more clarity over the false cognates and it stops being a false cognate and starts being just more explicitly well-defined term in the context. But sometimes you do have genuine aliases where even in a single context, um, you need to have two terms that refer to the same thing. So I'm just gonna uh, take a punt on it and say maybe in the property, uh, sorry, in the payments context, you might have the name settlement, but you also might have the name uh, payment, which is the same thing in that context. And so maybe some person comes along uh, and accidentally calls a field or a class or something payment. Um, and because we've defined it as an alias, and really not, that's oh, that's right, because I've, if we're getting the path filter, so now I have to go to the payments context, uh, and if um, someone put like a public fund payment, uh, then the word payment gets found and matches on the word settlement, and you can see here alias is payment, uh, and settlement is the definition. So we've got the settlement usage example, the alias of the payment, and uh, some of the definition. So this is all pretty cool, and uh, I'm pretty happy with it. And it's sort of, I don't know, launched about a year and a half ago, had a very fallow period of not doing much on it because I had some um, health issues, specifically my son sat on my head and I popped a disc, so I couldn't get out of bed for quite a while. Um, but I'm all better now, and I've kept and I've gotten right back into it and uh, had a bunch of updates in the last year, including the JetBrains rollout. Uh, and I've also got some ideas for some future work I'd like to do. And one of those is because we want the ubiquitous language to be genuinely ubiquitous. One of the questions often get asked is, well, so this is really helpful for developers. You know, they don't have to go and consult a wiki. It's like right there in their face. And if they're working on the code and they see, um, you know, a definition pop up and they go, hang on, that doesn't sound right. They can just go and fix it right there. Um, some people who've been using it tell me that it's really nice having the hover files, but it's actually even more amazing to have it, uh, the, the definitions file in the pull requests because other developers will see those definitions coming through and changing if they change. Um, and that, that's been really helpful for spreading awareness of the, of the context. So even if the other developers don't install the extension, they'll still see those changes in the PRs. Um, so that's kind of helpful. But of course, we would do want them to install the extension uh, and we want them to uh, you know, get the value of it in the ID of their choice. But that still kind of constrains it to just being for the developers. So one of the things we've been working on is like a, a Slack bot. And so a little script here that's ready to go, that's gonna push this file up into the Slack bot. And the Lambda has to wake up, but it looks like it's right there, working up and it's uh, got that now. Um, and I'm gonna switch over to Slack, but before I do that, I need to switch my Sharing. There it is. So I'm in a contextive channel in my little test Slack. And if, if someone is in a channel with some non-developers, some domain experts or BAs or whatever, and someone sends a message and says, oh, actually, I should do this video. Um, and says, uh, hey there, uh, how's the work going on the settlement uh, update? And this will take a second because it's, you know, a very low cost lambda. This is running at the moment, <laughs> it takes a minute to warm up. And every time this, I do this demo, I'm like, oh, please work. And then it works. And then we get, the, so literally just when I'm thinking it's not gonna work, it pops in. So we get a reply from the bot that says, here's a reminder of the property settlement context. Uh, the definition of settlement is the transfer of ownership of the property. And it says reminders for these terms won't be sent for the next two weeks. And so the idea here is like, you know, we're not going to like flood the channel with these updates. Uh, but, you know, I'm sort of planning to experiment a little bit with do we do this every two weeks or do we make it configurable or um, do we, you know, like be smart about it on a given, for a given word, how often we send an update. But the idea is that periodically 
this thing will say, hey, I noticed you just used a special word. This is what I believe the word means. Um, is that how you're using it? And if not, maybe you want to update it. And so none of these buttons do anything yet, but you know, you can click this to see the usage examples, hypothetically. Um, you can update the change of minor frequency so you don't get bugged so often. Uh, and you can maybe go and update the definition, which maybe is just a link to uh, like an edit page in your Git repo. So you can just update the definitions file straight in the Git repo. Um, and I'm thinking it will also be helpful to sort of clarify, you know, what are the usages in other contexts? Let's just make sure that I'm clear on this because I did, did find a project, the project I was working on that sort of inspired this, we definitely had some really tricky false cognates that had quite subtle variations in meaning between the contexts, uh, but they were very important. And it was very often confusing, particularly for developers that to switch between the contexts, do a lot of context switching, literally, um, but also for the stakeholders to be clear around what term you're using, because it wasn't always clear what context you were working in, uh, especially with, with conversations with stakeholders. So the idea of being able to say, well, as I believe, you're talking about transfer of ownership, but you know, being able to quickly see, and by the way, this means something else somewhere else, just to contextualize and to really reinforce what it is not as much as what it is, I thought could be quite helpful. Um, it doesn't do it yet, but the idea is then that you'd probably map a channel to a context. So you'd have like a team channel and the team channel will be tied to the context that they own or work on. Uh, and so in that team channel or in those areas, you get the definitions and maybe in other channels you say, well, I want all definitions here. So uh, it would come back with both of them by default. There's a lot of different directions we could take this in, um, but this demo and the response to it is definitely giving me motivation to do that because a lot of people are saying, I would love this, and I really want to get it. So uh, hopefully we get something like something running in a way that people can actually use it later this year. Um, and then beyond that, what I'd really like to do is uh, a, like a browser extension or maybe not a browser, like I'll probably start with a browser extension that does the same thing basically, gives you off hover and autocomplete um, and the ability to update and push changes so that you can get those definitions in your wiki. So you're browsing a different page of your wiki, you'll get hover definitions of the terminology. So a bit like a, a you know, very specialized Grammarly or something that's just like a business language specific uh, you know, support for that stuff. And I have this sort of like into end vision of this thing, which is that a customer service representative can be responding to a, an email or a ticket from a customer and they can see a sentence in that ticket that they think this is a really representative sentence for this word, uh, I'd really like the developers to see it. And they can highlight and say, add to definitions file. And then literally the developers are seeing that sam sample sentence in the usage examples in their hover text, because I, super, I would get super frustrated by people that come up with these artificial usage examples that are actually not representative of the way real customers uh, talk about the domain terms. And, and you know, that's probably the thing that I'm most conflicted about with this is because my personal mission is to get developers to talk to people outside the dev team far more often, uh, whether that's internal to the company or external to the company. Um, at the startup I was working, uh, that I co-founded, we used to run lunch ordering uh, for school canteens and we used to make all the developers go and make sandwiches in the canteen when they first joined the company, um, which I think was a really cool thing to do. And it really helped them connect with the domain. Uh, obviously it wasn't scalable, so I stopped doing that after a while, but. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I've always really cared about helping engineers and developers understand the business context that they're working in and the value that they're delivering. Um, so I'm a bit conflicted about this because I do worry that it could become a tool that will help developers not talk to the domain experts <laughs> because I don't need to, and it's all managed through the tool. So it's not meant to replace human conversation. Uh, it's just meant to support human conversation uh, and to help people identify when things are not right. So probably wouldn't be that people can just push updates, but it would be, oh, if you want to change this, these are the people you should go and talk to or, you know, send a message to them to recommend a change and, and spark a conversation so that you can uh, both learn something about the domain. Uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show. I think I've gone far less time, I don't know, how am I tracking, um, compared to what Sonal was worry, worried about. Um, I don't think there's anything else to demo in the tool itself. I think we've done all of the features of it, definitions, examples, aliases, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you can do markdown as well. So particularly in uh, Dardy, so if we make the definition, uh, you know, with some boldness in it, so the 31, we'll get, um, I don't know if you can see that, it's a bit subtle, but that word is bolded now. Yeah, um, and you can even, if you do like a multi-line uh, YAML thing, you can put, um, you know, what, in and get that. so you know it's proper markdown uh it's pretty cool and uh yeah 
If you're interested, uh, it's called Contextive. You can uh, Google it, it will come up. Um, the, the GitHub has links to installation instructions and, uh, and links to the various IDE extensions that you can use. Um, and if you do start using it, I'd love to get some feedback. Um, throw some issues on the Slack, uh, sorry, not on the Slack, on the, on the GitHub issue report if there's anything else you want us to do. Someone the other day was talking about um, asking for like rendering the definitions to an HTML file or some other medium that can be shared more broadly. Um, and I think it's a great idea. I'm definitely going to be working on that soon. So any other thoughts or ideas on how we can help um, improve the mission? Yeah, I was thinking, uh, have you thought about uh, a potential Figma plugin or something to get designers in the loop? Yeah, because that would be the, cool. The, Designers are the people who are showing the language to the business owner. And the language has its used yeah, in the UI. Exactly. Love it. So I think a browser extension would probably help with that. Um, but one comment that someone makes to me is that a lot of enterprises won't let people install browser extensions. So I'll probably also need like a dedicated Figma plugin or a Miro plugin or something. So, you know, one step at a time. <laughs> so I'll probably start with the browser plugin because that's yeah. more broadly applicable. Uh, and then start rolling out like dedicated plugins for other contexts, whether it's Figma or Miro or Confluence or a Notion. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places you could put it. Um, so yeah, definitely keen to do all of that. I'm like, one of the things that I was very uh, excited about when I started this project is because of the dream of making things ubiquitous, it would give me the opportunity to learn how to make something ubiquitous, to learn all of the different plugin environments and execution models and languages that I might need to do. And I thought that's a fun project. So yeah. Um, are. Yeah, and then where to put this stuff. So maybe like a Salesforce plugin or something as well, like a Salesforce app. Yeah. Have you considered uh, using like RDF or something instead of YAML? Or why did you pick YAML as uh... Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I picked YAML because I think I was thinking about the PR use case. So I think that the presentation of changes with YAML files in PRs is usually a little bit easier to read. Um, like XML based formats can be like difficult to parse in, in GIFs uh, because of, you know, the, the, it doesn't sort of necessarily always get sort of um, structured in a human readable way. Not always a problem, but it can, you know, I've seen that with other XML files be an issue before. So I was trying to choose something that would be more likely to be more easily interpretable in, in PR diffs. That was the initial choice. Um, but uh, there's another tool actually kind of, um, now that I mentioned, I'd like to give it a shout out called Chameleon. Uh, I came across the author at one of the conferences in Europe, uh, Marijn Huizenbels. He's very big in the DDD community over there. Um, and he's got a tool called Chameleon, which is just in the IntelliJ platform at the moment, but it's based, it's, you go to get chameleon dot something. Um, uh, I can't remember the dot com maybe. It's, um, uh, it's more of a supported refactoring tool. So when he saw me demo mine, he's like, hey, we should talk. Um, so he's kind of got a similar thing where he stores the definitions and the, but he's got more support for saying, this is what the term used to be, this is what it is now. And it gives you like a progressive support for gradually adopting that term over the time over time in the code base, and it leverages like the spelling checker. So even if a spell word is spelled correctly, but it's in the list of obsolete terms, it'll come up as an incorrectly spelled word, and it'll give you the like suggested spelling replacements are the new terms that are applicable or potentially usable uh, for that term. It's a really smart idea. But when we talked about it, we realized that we were had slightly different focuses. My focus from the start was about improving communications between developers and non-developers and his focus when start was on supporting refactoring but we realized there's a lot of commonality and so we've been discussing uh like a shared data file so you could have one data file and use both tools for different purposes and you can sort of you know maybe it's a bit grandiose but you start to imagine like an ecosystem of tools that sort of work with that same sort of like, like versioned well-defined schema of some sort if there's other people that want to um, build their own sort of tools that interact with it. And so we were kind of jokingly calling it open terminology. <laughs> not the... Yeah, if you use RDF, then you can use like the new version and you can connect everything and see all the past updates. And, yeah, could... yeah, absolutely. So it's not opportunity. I love the tools. It's a great idea. Yeah, cool. Thank you. But yeah, no, I mean, but you, you, know, you can imagine like we could support multiple formats one day and you know, choose the format that works for you. and. Um, so maybe RDF with like history track. You're thinking like RDF entries as like histories changes. I mean that's kind of in the Git history anyway. Yeah, you but you make the new, the whole ontology, right? So with different uh, bounded context, like have separate ontologies and different. Yeah, yeah. 
then you can see the relationships between the, the, the terminology as well. Yeah, the I think the relationships is an interesting one. I do want to explore that more. I think there's some value in sort of saying, here's a term and here's another term, and they are related to each other. Like one of them is a, a, an event that's associated with this term, which is an aggregate or some sort of like classification scheme and relationship structure. That could be really cool. And you're right, that'll be a bit trickier to do in YAML. Um, but that's a good idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that, have a bit of a think about how it could, could be applied. Any other questions? I, need, I should check on the, anything on the live stream channel? Should I check that? Right here. So, uh, if no one else, I have to yeah. have a part in seven yeah. minutes. That's no good. But I wanted to ask you for advice on, um, like if you're helping people do this, like how deep do you get into people's domains when you come into a company? Because it's, often takes a long time to learn oh, yeah. domain, right? Yeah. So how much effort do you spend on trying to get into their domains? Mm. And how much do you just kind of help them with DDD terminology and that there? Yeah, Build themselves. Yeah. There? Bit, bit of a mix. So I do um do training, which is more like, you know, it's just a structured uh, workshop format then helps them a bit learn about DDD practices, particularly strategic strategic DDD. And then for some consulting engagements, it's just, it varies with the company. So I've had one client where they've wanted some really deep support. And so we did like six, three hour big picture event storming workshops with like 30 people from across the whole company. Um, and that was really valuable. So we got into like some really deep understanding of like, or very broad understanding of the domain. And then we picked four sort of hotspots for deep dives. And for each of those hotspots, we did another four, three hour workshops um, with like process modeling and existing architecture review and sort of user story mapping to understand like a progressive change. So that's probably a, like a pretty intensive engagement. Like a lot of clients don't want to spend that much money on it. They, some other clients have just said, look, just come in and spend a couple of hours and give us a review. You know, are we doing anything wrong? It's like, I, I can, I'm barely going to be able to understand your domain after two hours, but I can certainly, you know, I can certainly spot things that you're doing definitely wrong. And, you know, if they're there, I'll let you know. And they were, and I did, but, you know, there's, um, Certainly wouldn't feel confident that I give them any meaningful advice around their domains per se. Um, but I usually just use it to try and give them like general tips and practices and like heuristics and ideas to ponder and references to further reading and all that kind of stuff. So it's very customer specific. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for coming. <laughs> Cheers. Um, not seeing any. Uh, I think there's no further questions from online. And if there's no further questions in person, there is. Could you give us some recommendations or resources for people who are into DDD to learn? Yeah, resources for learning DDD, absolutely. Um, I've got two that I think are awesome. So let me um, get those up so I can put them on the live stream as well. So the two are the GitHub created by a really cool group of people called the DDD crew. And they've got some awesome, uh, so I'm just going to share this. Um, yes, yeah, so they've got some great repositories here. So they've got like cheat sheets on event storming, context mapping, bounded context canvas, which is like a resource that you can use to help you document your bounded context. Um, you know, you can look at like understanding the interaction patterns with the bounded context and, you know, various other things. They've got uh, a really cool uh, thing called the DDD starter modeling process and a lot of definition and guidance around that. And this is kind of the, you know, like it's it's not a uh, rigid best practice, but it's a, like a continuous iterative design approach. But it encourages you to go through like an alignment phase, understanding the business model, uh, going through a discovery phase, so sort of storming or domain storytelling decomposing into subdomains, strategizing about the core and supporting domains, connecting up the domains, working like how you're going to interact between them, uh, organizing your teams around those domains, and then into like defining the resolves and responsibilities and, and getting into the code base and, and how you do it. It doesn't go into like, how do you do the tactical plans, but it's very much more like strategic. There's a lot of guidance in here. So I definitely recommend reading this. And then the other sort of go-to book, um, oh, actually I'll do it in here. This is the one that was shared. Vlad Kononov's Learning Domain Driven Design. This is like, it's it's pretty much regarded these days as like the best introductory text. So for a long time it was Eric's book and then it was Vaughn Vern's book, the Red Book. Um, 
Nick Tune wrote a book as well that a lot of people quite like. Nick doesn't like that book anymore. He says, don't read it. Uh, he said he's learned so much since then and he hates it. Um, maybe that's too strong a word. He doesn't, I don't know if hates is the right word, but he sort of feels like his, his understanding has evolved. And so he's got this new book, Architecture and Modernization, which said just won a copy of tonight. Um, and uh, you know, he, he recommends that one now. But in terms of pure DDD, Vlad Kononov's book, Learning to Manage that's definitely my go-to recommendation for newcomers. Uh, I've, I've had a few people uh, pick this up and read it and just feel very uh, supported in, in learning. Uh, about it so yeah that's probably the best the two best resources